And we are live. Welcome to another live stream with Eric Waite Whiskey Studies. Currently studying for the Council of Whiskey Masters for the Certified Specialist. Of, no, Certified Whiskey Specialist. Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> uh, all right. In this live stream, we're uh, looking at uh, Glenn Fittick Distillery. Uh, Donna Pass, thanks for tuning in. Uh, Chris McClure, thanks for uh, tuning in. So uh, I reviewed this past week the... Glenn Fittick, 12 year old. Uh, in that what video was my notes, <coughs> excuse me, on the history of uh, Glenn Fittick Distillery. But today I am going to be drinking a little bit of uh, the Glenn Fittick 14 year old, and then I'll have uh, a little bit of the 15 year old. You may notice that these two bottles, the, the cans look very similar in terms of the general style. Uh, and this one looks a little different. This is an older bottle. So if you were to buy another 15-year-old, excuse me, if you were to buy a 15-year-old, the can would be designed more like this. I really like the 15-year-old. Uh, I've had this for a while. Excuse me. Uh, it's about uh, more than halfway done. I'm going to drop the tube on the floor. Get that out of the way. Here's a 14-year-old. I've had a little bit of the 14-year-old. The 15-year-old is uh, a Solera cask, what they call a Solera cask. Uh, it's more like an infinity bottle. So rather than a Solera, uh, they have down here is or Sherry, in which you have a series of casks in which the wine goes from cask to cask to cask uh, until you get to the final row. Each row in a Solera is called a Cradera. And the last one's actually called a Solera. So it's a, a fractional blending system through a series of casks. And said what they do at uh, Glenfiddich is they have one big-ass cask that is never emptied. And it's so it's more like an infinity bottle than an actual cask. Uh, straight up between these three, um, they're all that 40% uh, alcohol by volume. Obviously different age, 12, 14, to 15. But out of three, if you're going to buy one, I prefer the 15-year-old. Uh, I think it's even at 40% alcohol by bomb, I think it's a really, really nice sherry cast. But we're going to start off with the 14-year-old. Now, as far as I can tell, I think this 14-year-old, it's an old uh, bourbon barrel cask uh, whiskey. They and they have a little advertisement, uh, you know, about America, the next great American whiskey. You know, they're playing into the old bourbon theme. It will actually be a scotch. So I, I don't think it's available. I could have swam it. I could have swore I had this. You know what? I haven't tasted it yet. I thought I had tasted it. I thought, well, it's, it must have been awkward high neck fill if I already had some of it and just got that. All right. So I guess I'm doing an uncorking. You know what it is? Where my videos are at now and what I'm doing, I'm down the road. The next bottle I'm going to do, next distillery we're going to do, and I, I think this is how I screwed that up, is Glen Mori. Is Glenn Mori. This is a fantastic whiskey. So this week, the review of this will be coming out. This is a first fill bourbon cask. That's what was on my head because I had this whiskey in my head. I was thinking I'd already tasted this one. This is, I'm just telling you straight up right now, this is an absolutely fantastic, fantastic whiskey. Uh, I'll tell you right now, if you can get a bottle, if you want, I would say a great representation of what a first fill bourbon cask can be like. This is it. Full review will be out probably Monday or Tuesday. And, of course, next Saturday we'll be talking about Glenn Murray. So this was on my mind when I was thinking about uh, this one. Because I had bourbon cask on my head. All right. So I'm going to pour myself in a little bit. Do a neck pour. I'm not going to review this whiskey yet. Sometime, some other time, some other day, whatever, I'll, I'll review it. Uh, I wanted to buy it just for giggles. To try another Glenfiddich, and it wasn't overly priced, but I don't have time to get into it because I'm trying to stay on a particular schedule and doing my my videos. So it's, it's funny; it smells whiny on the nose, like a Chardonnay. So it smells a little grapey, some vanilla, cinnamon, baking spices. A lot of vanilla, some pear. It 
tastes like a Chardonnay. It's funny um, because that's similar notes for the Glenmore. I'm already down to the label on that one. The one thing that really strikes me is how much it comes across like a California Chardonnay. And I'll get more into this next week or maybe even to the video and a review of it. California Chardonnays typically have a lot of oak influence, charred oak influence. Hence the charred oak character, particularly the spices. If you have malolactic fermentation, you get a or, or conversion, you get a little of that buttery character in there. And I get some of that both on this whiskey and even more so on the Glen Murray. Well, they really are nice. I'll be honest, I tend to have more sherry cask whiskeys than I do uh, oak. And if I do have our bourbon cask, and typically I, most are probably have been second fill. If you can get a first fill bourbon cask, you get a lot more of that presence in there. All righty. So uh, just as a reminder, so the textbook for this class is uh, The World Atlas of Whiskey by uh, Dave Broom. He's on the board. And he, and he's part of, you know, advisory committee and so forth for the Council of Whiskey Masters. So, and a very reputable writer. So I understand why they would want to use one of his textbooks. However, in terms of the depth of information that's provided in, my, in a, a textbook versus a coffee table or just an enjoyable book, it's huge. Um, this doesn't really come across as a textbook, and I'm kind of surprised they're using it for that purpose. Or if you have, hey, here's a textbook, and then here's some other re recommended or required reading, supplemental reading. So my videos and this live stream is going far, 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 far more in depth than this book ever does. If you read the chapter on Glenn Fittick in this book and then watch my video, you're like, wow, there's a lot more content in Eric's videos. But I don't mind because um, if I decide to go on to the next level, then all this studying and reading will help me towards that. So I, as if I'm studying actually for a whole nother level uh, within the uh, Council of Whiskey Masters. Mm -mm 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 -mm. So what are you guys drinking? Prime whiskey. Thanks for tuning in. So what are you guys drinking? I was kind of surprised by the comments um, on my review of the 12-year-old. How many people are really much more favorable uh, of the whiskey? They don't... Yeah, some people say it as, as an entry level, but some people, it's almost as if they're sort of their go-to. You know, one, you don't have to think about too much. It's not too expensive. Uh, very accessible. Uh, and really an uh, enjoyable dram. Um, David Belcher says he's having a, oh, Glenn uh, Fittick, Solera, 15-year-old. And I'll be joining uh, you there in that in just a little bit. All right. So why don't we get into our quiz, 10 quiz questions, all based on the video that came out this week. Everybody keeps their own scores. The main point of this is not uh, about scores per se, but to reinforce what we've already covered and already stuttered. Yeah, what stuttered, what we already studied, what we already studied. Grumpy old fart, thanks for uh, tuning in. Now he said, uh, I've read the book. Uh, I have the book and I've read it before viewing your feed. I think you gain more knowledge when you teach us the information. Thank you very much. And the, it's the one who prepares the lesson who learns the, more, the most, which is the entire reason why I'm doing these uh, to uh, begin with. All righty. Uh, because the amount of time, so that that video probably took me 16 hours to to, to create, and it, it's it's putting all the pictures and the trying to I could just talk to the camera and provide information, but it's putting pictures and video clips and creating video clips and montages and whatever else and all that it takes a lot of time to do that, but it makes it more engaging. So all right, let's go with our first question about Glenn Fittick, and uh, here we go. So. The founder of Glenn Fittick was A, John Grant, B, George Grant, C, William Grant, or D, James Grant. So there are a lot of Smiths and Grants. If you recall from our, the last two uh, videos, there are a lot of Smiths and Grants, a lot of Georges and Wims and James and John uh, in, in the neighborhood. So it's very easy 
to get these uh, confused, to get these uh, mixed up just a, a little bit. Um, so, yeah, it's Grant, Grant, Grant. It's Mr. Grant. Uh, David says, C. I don't know how to pronounce your name. Zaba Jaka or something like that. 88 says C. So this picture you see off to the right, that's the one they actually, you'll see, uh, the uh, Colonel Grant. That's the one you actually see at the distillery. It's hanging on the wall. But that's not the one I use in, in my video. And, of course, the answer is... Go to the next one. Answer is William Grant. William Grant. Of course, that becomes William Grant and Sons uh, in terms of the company name. All right, question number two. The Fittick Distillery, should be the Glen Fittick Distillery. The Glen Fittick Distillery was founded in 1823, 18, B, 1824, C, 1836, or D, 1886. In what year was Glenfiddich? I just put the Fiddick. Hey, it's the Fid, man. It's the Fid Distillery. We're just going to call it Fid for short, man. Just We'll just call it, hey, it's the Fid. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Whiskey with Molly says C, 1836. Uh, Zab says B. David Belcher says D. Um, Taste and Sensibility says B. Grumpy Old Fart says D. This is a test to see if you're paying attention to my videos or even, or even watching them. And how much information retained? Prime whiskey says D. All right. So what is the answer? 1886. Is that right? 1886. 1886. Let's see if it says it on the bottle. Usually they say it on the bottle. Why am I questioning myself? Because I the problem is, is by the time I put this on there, I'm already working on another distillery. And I'm already working on another distillery. So in my head, I'm two distilleries ahead. I'm two distilleries ahead. And so right now, what's on my head is actually Glen Goyne Distillery. So I already did my video, the history part for uh, Glen Mori. All that, that, that that's done. I'm currently working on uh, Glen Goyne. So right now, in my head is Glen Goyne. And all these Glens and Glens and Glens, it's easy to get them mixed up in your head. I would be better if I just stuck to one and didn't do anything until I moved on to the next one. But I'm trying to work work ahead. All right, so 1886, 1886. All righty, next. Um, number three, yep, 1886. Prior to founding Glenfiddich, William Grant worked for 20 years at what distillery? By the way, so if you look into the far left picture there, I put the word, that's Glenn Fettick is way off to the left, far left on, on the picture. So he started working there, I believe he was 17 years old. He worked his way through the distillery until he became the manager. So prior to founding Glenn Fettick, where did William Grant work? Did he work at A, Glenn Levitt? B, Glenn Ferkless? C, Mortlock or D. Abelauer or D. Abelauer. Where did he work? Eric, um, Zab says, I got to go. I want to ask a question. Do you plan to make a live about Talisker uh, Distillery? So I have a Facebook group. Uh, I posted a list of all the distilleries I'll be covering in that group. I also um, had posted in the comment section of the list of distilleries I'll be covering. Uh, and yes, Talisker is one of the distilleries on the list. I'm not choosing the distilleries. The distilleries that I have to study are chosen by the Council of Whiskey Masters. And yes, Talisker is on that list. All right. So Grumpy Old Fart says B, Glenn Farkless. Taste and Sensibility says D, Avalar. Uh, David Belcher says B, Glenn Farkless. I think, wow, I'm kind of surprised. Nobody's gotten it right yet so far. Chris McClure says B. So guys got to be careful. Don't because someone else says something, go, oh, he must be right because I don't remember. So I'm just going to go along with what that guy says. So thus far in this series, 
we've covered Glenn Lovett. Actually, um, yeah, we covered Glenn Lovett, and we covered Glenn Farkless. Don't be a fart, says Abelauer. Wow, nobody, nobody has gotten it right. <laughs> I'm really surprised by this. Nobody has gotten this one right. The answer is Mortlock. It's actually Mortlock Distillery. So I, I and I kind of figured, you know, if someone didn't watch the, the 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 video and didn't remember from the video, because we've already talked about Glenn Fiddick, we've already talked about Glenn Farkless, then that those are kind of be stuck in your mind. And because there's already grants mentioned in the other videos that you're kind of thinking, oh, Grant, Grant, oh, Barbara Grant, oh, he was probably over at one of those other distilleries that we already talked about that had grants associated with it. But he actually worked at Mortlock, uh, Mortlock Distillery. I believe he was started 17 years old, worked his way up into management, and then started uh, Glenn Fittick. Now, there's actually some other videos you can watch in which they have actors playing the role of uh, William Grant. And the way they put the in the videos is, is as if he was a manager and he didn't go, oh, I've had a great time here. Uh, I've learned a lot. I've saved up some money. Now I'm going to go start my own distillery. They seem to portray the story as if there was some sort of, let's say, um, unfriendly parting that he left Mortlock in a huff, went down and then started Glenn Fittick, and a bunch of other people from the town followed him to go help him start the distillery. That's the way, if you just search around on Vimeo and YouTube about, about distill, uh, what's the videos made by Glenn Fittick or that they hired someone else to make the videos for them, that's the way they tell the story. Uh, I don't know how factual, it does seem more dramatic to tell a story like that. Like, he set out on his own. I'm out of here. I'm going to go down and start my own distillery, you know, and people are like, yeah, and then they're going to follow him down the road and they're marching down the road and there's, he has just fallen and they're just stop. Everybody is like as if he's Jesus, right? If, if you read the gospels, Jesus comes along and he says to her, hey, um, come follow me. And they, and the disciples, they drop their nets or fishing and they come follow him and he's walking along and he calls people. And all of a sudden these people are just, they're stopping what they're doing and they're following Jesus. <laughs> well, They've kind of portrayed William Grant as this whiskey Jesus. <laughs> and people are like, oh, yes, the, the whiskey Messiah. Uh, yes, we must follow him. We're going we're gonna to stop working where we're working and doing what we're doing. And we're just going to quit right now and just go follow this guy and help him build a distillery. Uh, I think it's a lot of hoo-ha. Um, I, I, I seriously doubt it, it's anything like that. But if you watch the videos, um. That's the way they put it. But anyway, yep. Yeah, so he worked at uh, Mortlock. Worked at Mortlock Distillery. Um, all right. Next question. Glen Fittick means Valley of the A, Fiddler. B, Steer or Cow. Or as they say in Scotland, the Key. The Highland Key. C, deer, valley of the deer, or D, valley of the antelope. Yeah, 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 David Butcher, as if he was the Pied Piper of Scotch, exactly. <laughs> so what is Glenn Fiddick? Is, is that Fid Fiddick related to Fiddler? You know, someone who plays the fiddle? Uh, does it mean steer, cow? I got to say, uh, the highlands in space that have the cutest cows. In the, they look like sheepdogs. Have you ever seen one? This, type in later on Google images uh highland cow they look like sheep dogs they're red you can't see their eyeballs because they have long hair and it, it covers up their eyeballs like a sheep sheep dog but they have horns they seem very friendly but I'm, i was never they seem like i wanted to go pet them but i wasn't really sure if i should i didn't know if i would i didn't want to be gored by a um um by a cow by highland highland key but a lot of distilleries including mccallan um, Cardu, a lot of the distillers have these cows around. All righty. Uh, the answer is, now, if you, it, it, you should be able to tell just by the logo. Let me just look at the logo. That's where I put antelope, all right? You should just tell by the logo. It's obviously Valley of the Deer, Valley of the Deer. All right. 
Next question. Question number five. Glenn Fittick first ran its stills in 1887 on A, New Year's Day, B, Christmas Day, yeah, <laughs> antelopes in Scotland. Hey, you never know. Way back then, they might have had antelopes. <laughs> they probably had penguins and polar bears, zebras, elephants. I mean, we had we had elephants, you know, mastodons and so forth in California uh, and in North America. Uh, yes, we had elephants here one time, a very long time ago, and uh, they all died back in the probably in the Ice Age. All right. So Glenn Fittick first ran its distills, its stills on 1887 on A, New Year's Day, B, Christmas Day, C, Boxing Day, which is the day after Christmas, or D, Valentine's Day. All right. Um, everybody, most people are getting this one right. If you remember from my video, to help as a memory device, I put I put someone in the video. I put a there's a there's a clip of Santa Claus flying over flying over the distillery, so uh, the answer is Christmas Day, Christmas Day. Now. So if you saw my video, I have you know I I so I had a, a black and white f f photo of uh, the distillery and I put snow coming in you know green screen use snow and then Santa Claus comes flying through the video to help help you remember um, that it was on Christmas Day. I could have put a Christmas tree or a little baby Jesus, you know, a, a manger, uh, a nativity scene in there as well, but I you know put Santa Claus in there. The question I have is, dude, did you not celebrate Christmas? Or could you couldn't wait like one more day? You had to start it on Christmas Day. You know what was? I I don't understand. Maybe they didn't care about Christmas, or they weren't celebrating into celebrating, or he didn't care. I don't know. Pear, apple. Vanilla, cinnamon. It's silky smooth. So this is a forty-three percent alcohol by volume. This I'm, I, I'm, I'm. This is oops. This is the fourteen-year-old. The fourteen-year-old. I think it's an American exclusive. A Glenfiddich fourteen-year-old bourbon cask. Um. It comes across as like a, a, a California Chardonnay, but more ABV. And it's, it does have, you know, I guess even with that 40 ABV, it doesn't feel thin. You know, it doesn't have that big burn or bite or tingle, um, but it doesn't feel thin. It has a, 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 actually a, a pretty good oily, round, thicker mouthfeel. Um, finishes, mm, moderate. It didn't have a whole lot of evolution. It's not not super super complex, but it's an all right whiskey. It's an all right whiskey. All right. Next question. Number five. Oops, I already got that one. Sorry. Answer was Christmas Day. Next. In eighteen ninety two, William Grant and Sons also founded what other distillery? So they started, William Grant started another distillery and sons. He's getting up there in age by this time. What was the other distillery? Was it A, Abelauer, B, Balvenie, C, Cardew, or D, Deftown Distillery? Now, if you notice, I put A for Abelauer, B for Balvenie, C for Cardew, and D for Deftown. So which one? Grumpy of Farts says, uh, <laughs> uh, says, Copper Still, what a great present to open and play with. Yes. <laughs> All right. So what was the other distillery? Was it A, Abelar, B, Balveni, C, Cardew, or D, Deftone? Def uh, Cardew is very close by. It is in the neighborhood. As is um, some of the other ones. Copia Fart says Bob Vinny. Chris McClure says B. 
Let's go with Molly says B. David Belcher says B. Looks like people are getting this one all right. And the answer is B, Balvini, the Balvini Distillery. All right. You know what? Look at it. Up in the left-hand corner, it says number one. I didn't change the number. I numbered this one wrong. I'm not, I'm not sure how I did that. Oh, well. At the end of the USA's prohibition in 1933, the Glenn Fitterick, Fitterick, the Glenn Fitterick, the Glenn Fittick Distillery was a was one of six remaining Scotch distilleries. So at the end of Prohibition, which one of these is true? Oh, Grumpy Fort says the picture is Balvenie, right? But not everybody would recognize that. So, but if you saw that, then you get extra points. Was it? So what's true about at the end of Prohibition? It was one of six remaining Scotch distilleries. B, the distillery was reopened. In other words, it was closed during the Prohibition, and but it was reopened. C, it went bankrupt. Because of being closed, it went broke, it went bankrupt. Or D, it burned down. So which was it? Now, one of these... Uh, well, I'll, well, I'll go on. So was one of six remaining Scotch distilleries, it reopened, it was bankrupt, or burned down. Which one is it? Uh, taste and sensibility says a grumpy of heart says a it's like everybody's saying a a a a a uh it is the longest answer on there sometimes that's a, a a tip that it's the correct answer but that's not always true that's not always true but in this case it is it was one of six remaining scotch distilleries so something to keep in mind sort of side note sorry my, my eyes are i have allergies and and my eyes are kind of goopy at the moment um, right now, the, the, with the current boom of, of Scotch whiskey or whiskey in general is there is a focus, I think more or less on quality over quantity. They're not repeating the errors they had before. You know, one time, uh, Cameltown had 32 distilleries, um, and a lot of the distilleries, particularly in the lowlands, there were just, it was just a machine, just a factory, just pumping it out. And it was just. They're producing crap, quantity over quality, and I don't think I don't think that's the case today. It's quality over quantity, and I don't think the enthusiasm for Scotch whiskey is any danger. I think that'll remain. Um, prices are getting ridiculous. I believe, and so if, if you saw my series, I did a series on the history of Scotch whiskey, and what tend to cause the busts in the industry tended to be war. Prohibition um, and stupid errors and stupid errors. I mean, the and, oh, and then little times in which they had shortage of malt due to weather and stuff like that. They had malt shortages due to weather. I, I think they've mitigated for the most part um, weather issues because they source barley up and down all along the East Coast of the UK and Europe. Scotch whiskey does not have to be made from Scotch barley to be Scotch whiskey. They can get barley anywhere. So it doesn't have to be native. Most of the whiskey comes from along the eastern side of the UK. A lot of come from out of England. There are pockets of, you know, barley fields on the West Coast and on a little on Isla, but that's a very small percentage. I think the Biggest danger or potential threat to the current boom in, in Scotch whiskey is something outside of the whiskey industry that it has no control over. And it's, I would say that's going to be a, um, something akin to a repeat of the Great Depression or Great Recession. So it'll be world economics, number one. And two, we are building up towards another war. If you haven't heard in the news, uh, currently uh, the U.S. has troops doing training exercises um, uh, in many Western European, uh, excuse me, in European uh, countries along the border. And we are apparently, according to what they say in the news, we're sending armaments and so forth to the Ukraine. Things are building up. Things are building up. 
Uh, right now, of course, we have fuel. Gas prices now I've seen as high as $7, which is insane. That has, uh, I'm sorry to get into this. Normally, I don't discuss politics or whatever else uh, on this channel, except if you pay attention to patterns and history of what affects what, um, excuse me, then you could see this leads to this, and I'm not a prognosticator, right? That you could see this could lead up to um, an impact on Scotch whiskey. Now, one of the things in Scotch whiskey, not only in terms of economics, in terms of people to be able to buy whiskey, but the barley that would have been used to produce uh, whiskey was going towards other resources, namely food to feed troops fighting in the First and Second World War. And alcohol was being used for something else because there are other uses for alcohol other than just um, drinking it. Like during this current pandemic, a lot of distilleries uh, st stopped making whiskey and started producing hand sanitizer uh, due to the pandemic. I do not know what will come in the near future. I mean, having said that, if there's anything that's going to affect the Scotch whiskey industry, potential current buildup with war, secondly, um, rapid inflation uh, due to current administrations and how they're doing things, uh, and, and that's going to be it. And now, if some sort of weather impact, weather that we can't control, that could come along as well, but uh, who knows? That's a little, a little bit more... Um, Great use for vodka, uh, hand sanitizer. There you go. All right. Next question. Da -da -da -da. I think we had number seven last. All right. Let's back up, make sure. Yep. Question number eight. Excuse me. Yep. It was the one, one out of six remaining distilleries. Question number eight. In 1961, Glenn Fittick introduced its iconic triangular bottle. Designed by, who designed it? A, Ananias Coffee. B, Robert Bobby. C, Char Charles Doig. Or D, Hans Schleger. By the way, all four of these names uh, are inventors. All four of these names are inventors, designers, whatever, in the Scotch whiskey industry. But only one of them had anything to do with the triangular bottle for Glenn Fittick. Belcher says D. Taste and Sensibility says D. Uh, Michael Gonzalez, you're never too late, but thanks for joining in. Gonzalez says D. Donner Pass Whiskey says D. Looks like everyone's getting this one. Now, you could either already know what the other names, what the other guys did, and that, therefore, by process of elimination, you guess D. Or because you watched the video or paid attention, you know it's D, Hans Schlager. Hans Schlager. So, Ananias Coffee, uh, he perfected the column still, also known as uh, a coffee still. He was an Irishman, but did it in Scotland. Robert Bobby. Uh, there is the Bobby Mill. If you ever visit a distillery, uh, one of the most common distilleries you see is the Bobby Mill. And as the story goes, uh, it was so well created. They didn't break down and consequently uh, didn't need to be replaced. Constantly putting himself out of business. Charles Doig, of course, of course made the, they call it a, a, a pagoda. It's a ventilator. Um, but uh, there's, it's actually technically more a cupola. C-U-P-L-L, uh, C-U-P. ALA couple of, but they call it a ventilator anyway. But so yeah, the designer is Hans Schlager. Hans Schlager. So one of the things Glenn Fittick is, is known for, one of, the thing, one of the things they did really, really well um, is, is, is marketing. Um, marketing and branding. But while they have done some schlock, sticky stuff, you know, like McAllen has done, other distillers have done that sort of, you know, someone from the marketing department just getting a little out of it, doing stupid advertisements that tell you nothing about the whiskey. I don't mind really well-created, artful 
uh, humorous, whatever, advertising, but I think it should tell you something about the whiskey and not just, you know, showing women with big tits or uh, people driving around fancy cars, wearing fancy clothing, wearing fancy washes, watches or whatever, the nightlife, you know. Tell us something about the whiskey. Nothing wrong with women with big tits. Just saying. But if that's what you're, if you have to do resort to that in order to get, um, uh, <laughs> Ricky Bobby was the driver. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it, in order to sell your whiskey, then something's wrong with your whiskey. You should be able to sell your whiskey because it's a quality whiskey. That being said, you know, if there, you have shelves of a particular product, wines, spaghetti sauce, salad dressing, or whiskey, and, and there's a lot, a lot of bottles, you got to do something to make it stand out. So, ooh, what's this? This is a little different. And so one of the things it, it, it's done is the iconic, you know, that sort of triangular bottle that really makes it stand out. Um, you think of uh, Johnny Walker has the angular label. It goes diagonal across the bottle, and then they have these rectangular or square bottles, which makes them fit on the shelf really, really, really well. But those, it's just that, that this is that little thing, that little thing that makes it pop out, seem a little different. And so people get curious and you want to try it out. So, um, other than that, I don't know if any advantage, other than I do like this. I like the way that feels in my hand. This is flat up against my palm. And then the fingers just kind of just go over the edge. I like the way that feels. Honestly, I do. I like the way that feels in my hand. Now, unless you're going to carry it around, you know, and be, you know, it's not going to spend a lot of time in my hand. The only time to spend my hand was when I'm pouring a little bit into my glass. That being said, I like the feels in my hand. I like the way it looks. Uh, I like the design of the bottle. I'm, I'm going to give it a, I, I like the design. Uh, I think it's uh, well played. The stag symbol, one of the problems with the stag symbol is there's at least, one of these days I'll I'll do a search. There are a lot of distillers that use the stag, the deer. Um, so one of these days I'll do, a, I'll do a picture of video, a test question, which I'll put the logos from various distilleries all using the deer or the stag and then see if people can identify which one belongs to what distillery because it's, it's a common symbol uh, used. I'm kind of surprised, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think any Highland distilleries use the Highland Q, the cow, which is so cute, uh, as an icon, right? People love those cows. I love those cows. Why not put a Highland cow as your logo? And you could even have like little cute little stuffed animal Highland cows for the kids or whatever, you know. Uh, Dan James says, there is a strange shaped uh, turd in my garden. Should I eat it? What? 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 There is a strange shaped turd in my garden. Should I eat it? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Grumpy of Heart says, I thought the designer was not to allow uh, it to roll. Very well could have been. I've not seen that, but it makes sense. It makes sense. Uh, you know, if it... Let me make sure this is down real, real good. Makes sense. Falls over. It's not going anywhere. It's not going to roll. How much of a problem people have with their bottles rolling away? I don't know. Uh, but but your, your bottles don't sit on their side. if they're with, Only if they're wines with corks, they stand up. Uh, could that be an advantage if it fell over? It wouldn't roll away? I guess. I guess. Uh, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, go for it. Uh, James, James uh, just go ahead and eat, eat the funny-shaped turd. Go for it. By the way, I'm, I am I, I need to put charge my mouse, so I'm having to lean forward and uh, push a manual this way. All right, next question. Mm -mm -mm. Question number nine. Who insisted that Glenfiddich have its own in-house coppersmiths 
Now, this question's a little more challenging. Cooper's and bombing plant. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Grant Gordon. Charles Grant Gordon. Sandy Grant Gordon or Peter Gordon. This is one of those families where they keep using the same name over and over and over again. And you have a, more than one distiller using the name Grant so is it Grant Gordon, Charles Grant Gordon, Sandy Grant Gordon, or Peter Gordon? Or Peter Gordon? Belcher says B. The history section of the video is only... Um, yeah. Charles Grant Gordon, Sandy Grant Gordon, or Peter Gordon? Uh... Mark says G. That's, a, that's always an option, I guess. Grumpy Old Parts says B. Michael Gonzalez says B. And the answer is Charles Grant Gordon. Charles Grant Gordon. Sandy Grant Gordon. Um, if I recall correctly, he was the one that sort of did the worldwide marketing and traveled around the world uh, and sort of doing international uh, marketing. Um, Peter Gordon is the current reigning head of Glenfiddich Distillery. So, Peter Gordon is the current head of Glenfiddich Distillery. All right. The water source, here's the last question. The water source for Glenfiddich Distillery is A, the River Spey, B, Josie's Well, C, the Loch Ness, or D, Bobby Dew Spring. Now, as long as the water's clean and fairly cool, um, it doesn't really contribute a whole lot of flavor. And if you had something in the water, you'd want to put it through a water purifier. So making a big deal about your water source isn't that important. Now, water is extremely important. And in, and in ancient times, you know, you were one who depended on the natural source and they didn't have filters and all that kind of thing. So you can... so. You know where they got the water from. Now you could use tap water and just make sure it doesn't have anything in it. it Should be in it and do your filtering. It's probably not going. Wouldn't be any dang difference. But so do they use water from the River Spade, Josie's Well, the Loch Ness, where the giant monster swims around in? Oops. Belter says D. Gonzalez says D. Michael Gonzalez says D. Dan James says E. Uh. Grumpy Old Fart says D, and the answer is D, Robbie Do Spring, Robbie Do Spring. Yeah, so I toured the distillery, uh, and they have a little water fountain there, the water coming out, and you can actually taste water coming from the Robbie Do Spring while you're there. It's a nice touristy thing to do. Does it significantly contribute? To the taste of the water. Some distilleries make a big deal of it. Glen Goyne makes a big deal of it. They go, oh, we don't have any peat in our land. A lot of uh, hillsides, mountainsides is like basically peat. Um, it's not just like near the ocean. And so, so Glen Goyne makes a big deal. We don't have any peat in the soil from our water source. So we're not getting any peat character. We have we're distinctly not doing any peaty, peated whiskeys and yada, yada, yada. They make a big deal of it. Um, whatever. Um, it's, and you can go, when you visit Glen Goyne, you can see the little water fountain come down, the water come down to where the distillery's at and all that. Um, they're not getting the water out of there. I'm just telling you, they're not getting the water out of there. They ain't. Um, all righty. All right, so how did everybody I do out of the 10 out of 10? Of course, the most important thing is not what score you got. Uh, did you get the new Ardbeg, uh, Eric? What's your thoughts? Are you are you talking about the NFT one or are you talking the other one? I'm currently a little unhappy with Ardbeg in the direction that they are currently going. I'm not thrilled. Uh, for now, I was I'm not buying any committee releases this year. Any more committee releases this year. I don't know if I'll buy some next year. I'll make that decision when I get there. I think the core range of Ardbeg is excellent. Still big fan. Love the 10, the Ugadol, the Koi Vrecken. Uh, 
them and all and so forth. But I'm not buying in these current bottles. My focus currently so much is on, on the current study uh, that I'm doing. So I'm not chasing any iron bag bottles at the moment. Um, I just became a member of the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. I'm going to do a video uh, in their future. T uh, 10 reasons why I joined the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. So, um, and I think my reasons, some of my reasons for doing it are going to be different than the average consumer. I think, namely... You're gonna get you can get some access to some distilleries that don't release to the general public or that are available to be bought through them uh, that you wouldn't be able to otherwise get. Um, so if you wanted a whiskey from some of these distilleries that don't bottle, because most of the whiskey goes into a blend, the only way you're gonna get one is through an independent bottler and Scotch Malt Whiskey Society gets these bottles. So if you want to study a particular distillery. And have a whiskey from it to know what it would be like. This is the only way you're going to ever get one. And then there's some other distilleries you never ever going to see. If you go to Scotland, you can get bottles from certain distilleries that you can't get here in the United States. Period. Uh, I know because I've seen them when I've been there. So that's one of the reasons. Anyway, I'll get more into that and into another. Um, yeah, that's ridiculous. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Oh, by the way, so uh, Bill, the Whiskey Dictionary just did a video on NFTs. Art bag's not the first one to do one. I put a post, a link to it uh, on my Facebook group, as well as the community section. Um, highly recommend checking out that video. I think Bill did a really, really good job to uh, very straightforward, um, clearly explain what an NFT is. Uh, and so far, I, I, short, concise, clear, uh, just a, did a great job. You can listen to Ralphie rant about NFTs, and you will not understand what the hell an NFT is. At the end of it, you will not... You're not going to understand what an NFT is. Bill does an excellent job, an excellent presentation of explaining it and what whiskey NFTs are. Bill just did a great job. So uh, you're going to want to check that out. Um, all righty. So I am going to move on to uh, the 15-year-old. Grab another glass. Mm -mm -mm -mm. And move this over. So what do I think about this? It's an okay whiskey. Um, generally, it's comparable to the 12-year-old, but with a slightly different uh, flavor profile because it's bourbon cask. Uh, rather than this is bur the 12 is bourbon cask and some sherry cask. Other than that, my again, this is just a neck pour assumption. I don't expect it to change a whole lot. I just don't think it's going to. Um, So I'm gonna pour this. I'm gonna be back in two seconds. I'm gonna go grab something. I meant to have it here off to my side, but I'll be right back in just a second. Keep yourselves entertained. Sorry, I meant to have these off to the side earlier. Let me get these things out of the way. Twelve back here. Let's put the four, get the fourteen out of the way for now. All right, so I uh, have a wee bit of the Glenfiddich 15-year-old, then a Solera cask. So basically, it's a big, huge vat that they continually putting whiskeys into for aging to, as a, a means of blending. So rather than going from cask to cask to cask for fractional blending, they're doing a big-ass cask. So it basically, it's a nice, sherified cask, minimum 15 years old. Exactly what you would expect. Dread black fruit notes. Maybe some raisins. Um, probably Christmas cake, panettone roll, dried fruit notes. A little bit of raisins. Cinnamon, a lot of spice. Cinnamon, 
brown sugar, vanilla. So even though it's at the same ABV, it has a lot more going on than the other two expressions. Spicy finish. Um, in terms of a bite and, and so forth, you know, it has 40 ABV, similar to the other two whiskeys. However, it's the delivery of the spices that are really selling this one. Right now, I can still taste it. It's very spicy. Baking spices, cinnamon, nutmeg, clove, cardamom, those dried fruit notes, both red fruits, raisins, little candied fruits that you might have in, you know, panettone roll. It's an, that's an Italian dessert roll or a Christmas cake or um, something like that. I think you get the idea. Vanilla. Um, apples with cinnamon on it. Maybe a little bit of dried peach as well. So some stone fruit notes. So out of the three of them, if I was going to recommend one, this is one I'd go for. I just think it delivers a heck of a lot more, even though it's only at 40%. All right. So what I have here is I do not know, I haven't decided yet whether I will go on to the next level with the Council of Whiskey Masters. I haven't decided yet. Um, however, even if I don't, I want to read the books that are required reading. So a couple of weeks ago, I got an email uh, about the, the course, even though I haven't taken the second level exam yet, I got an email about it and they basically give you an outline of what the testing process is like. Uh, there's three different parts. There is a, a written test, uh, eight essay questions, which is similar to WSET, Weinsberg Educational Trust. Um, so I'm used to that. My biggest challenge with that is I have really bad handwriting it doesn't take, and it gets worse as I get older. Uh, as I get older, my hand, and I try you try to write an entire page. Uh, my handwriting just gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, more difficult to read. Also, I don't think um, when I'm putting thoughts together, a strict chronological fashion of how I would write something. Because with a computer, and you're writing something, and then later on you think it's something else, it's no problem. You can put it in here. And if you think, you know what, this thought here on a paragraph, this paragraph here will be better up here so you can move things around. So you can put your thoughts down and dates and da 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 da, da on the computer and you go, oh, this will be better up here. I'm going to move this over here. Oh, that part is too long. Oh, you know, oh, this is a run on sentence. I'll change this so you can edit. So 99.99% .99 of my writing, I do, I do a lot of writing of all kinds. Um, but if your habit is, you know, that you can move things around, you don't have to think in a boom, boom, boom fashion. Consequently, I'm not used to handwriting in that fashion. So what you have to do with essay questions of that type, um, I think you get two hours to write essay, uh, eight, uh, uh, eight essays, which is similar to WSET Diploma, is what you first do, excuse me, for what you first do is don't start writing. You write your, you write bullet points. Boom, 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 so that you have more of a streamlined train of thought. Boom, 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 boom. And then when you're actually writing, you do that on a side piece of paper. Um, and there's going to be thoughts that are going to come to your head, and you don't want to forget them. Dates, names, places. So you can, as a date pops in your head, you write them up on a side piece of paper. Dates, names, places off the top of the side of the paper. You figure structurally how you want to write it. You write, a, you write a sort of sketch a uh, basic three, four points. That's how you want to structure your, your little essay. And then you have all your basic information on a, a note paper. Now you put together your actual uh, answer to the question. They, I don't know if they're going to use blue books or what they use. Some sort of, probably some sort of special paper where you got to open it up and it's time. You should read the question. You gotta, so that's how you do it. Is you use a blank piece of paper to sketch out your ideas and then move it over. Um, of course, when you're stressed and you're nervous and you're in a hurry, it makes it all the more challenging. But that's what the W set is like, both the level three and the level four for the diploma. Uh, that's how you do that. So uh, then another part of is uh, a, a verbal. 
Um, so you're being, you're interacting with the examiners. Um, I don't know how long that goes on. So you're going to be able to think off the top of your head and be able to answer eloquently and accurately. And then there is a two-hour blind tasting. They give you, I believe, I, I, I'm sorry, I'll do a better presentation of this later. I think six or eight classic styles of whiskey. Um, they give it to them blind, and you have to talk about the whiskeys, describe it, you know, and so forth. That, I think, would be, for me, the easiest to do out of it. Um, but uh, anyway, so that's basically it. The textbooks. What I want to show you is the textbooks. So when I saw what the textbooks are, you know, I'll go ahead and order them. Go ahead and order them. Um, so I'm going to read all these books. I am going to create flashcards. So you buy these little, you know, little cards like this, whatever. And you just, every time you come across, it's a salient point, underline it, highlight it, and then you make a flashcard. So basically, this is how I studied for the Court of Master um, At the end, by the time I took the exam, I had stacks, like four, probably multiple stacks of just flashcards, flashcards. And what you do is you make a stack of, take a stack of flashcards, you put them in your pocket. And throughout the day, you're just pulling, every once in a while, sitting on the can, you're at lunch, whatever you're doing, you're, you're at a bus stop, whatever, you're on a hold on the telephone, you, you're just going through your flashcards. What's this and this? And the answer, and you just quizzing yourself, right? So those are good for short answers, not for essay questions. So basically, and then at the end of the day, you put that stack, you put a rubber band around it, put, a, put that stack away and you grab another stack and then you carry it around the next day. So basically you're working through your, through your stacks of uh, flashcards and grilling yourself. And that's, and that's how you do it. That's a very old school way, way of, of doing things. So the way I do things is I read the book, I underline, write notes and highlight create flashcards, and, of course, doing videos like this. All right, so the first book, this is by Hans Offringer, uh, probably Dutch, uh, A Field Guide to Whiskey, an Expert Compendium to Take Your Passion and Knowledge to the Next Level. I'll probably do a whole next series on this in some in the near future. Uh, this is one of the textbooks. I haven't started reading any of these, but I will probably tonight or tomorrow. I just got these. In fact, some of these books I got last Saturday uh, after um, we did the live stream. I will post something in the Facebook group on this. This is by Lou Bryson. Uh, one of his other textbooks uh, uh, books is a textbook for uh, the class to, for the school down in Texas. They use one of his books. This is Whiskey Masterclass, an Ultimate Guide to Understanding Scotch, Bourbon, Rye, and More. Lou Bryson, the Whiskey Master Class. I am a bit of a bookophile. I am into books. I've got thousands of books. Um, and they're a pain in the ass to move when you go from one place to another and put them in boxes and they collect a lot of dust. I'm sure there are people who prefer to get electronic copies and they store it all on their computer or on their whatever. I'm very old school. I, I like my books. I look. I, I like my books. I like handling them. I like the smell of them. Adam Rogers, proof the science of booze. Yes, I'm a boozeologist. I'm Doctor Boo. I have a doctor in boozeology. Uh, really? Yes, I'm a doctor of booze. Went to Booze University. Studied boozeology. All right. Proof, the science of booze. I don't know if these books are any good or not. What they're like, I haven't gotten them yet. All right. Joseph McAuliffe, M-I-C-A-L-L-E-F, Scotch Whiskey, It's History, Production, and Appreciation. So this is another one. Uh, I wonder if Dan, Daniel Whittington, if he happens to be watching, I'm kind of curious if he has these books. Uh, so I will post this in my Facebook group in terms of what the books are. So if you want to buy them just for your own reading, I'm kind of curious if I bet you he has these already. I would not be surprised if he had, not only has these, he's already read these. Um, knowing Daniel. Um, this next one's by Charles McLean. It looks like more of a coffee table book. Uh, I say that because of the size. Coffee table books tend to be large. They have, tend to have great photography, right? This is a book where you open yourself, you, you, you know, you get yourself a wee dram. You read a couple pages. You read it, say, Bal Blair, right? So here's a section on Bal Blair. You pour yourself a wee dram, 
and you sit in your chair comfortably and you read a chat. It's a few pages, you know. Photography is great, you know, um, but there's more photography than there is than there is actual content. But uh, it's, I'm sure it's a great book. Looking forward to uh, getting into it. So it's similar to, of course, I already brought this one up. David Broom's book is uh, on the list as well. So, all righty. Uh, I think that's it in terms of the textbooks for the class. Uh, I went ahead and ordered them uh, for the next level. Even if I don't take the exam, I plan on uh, reading the books. Uh, and then I will decide after I finish this current course um, whether I want to go into or not. In case you're wondering, um, it's fit, uh, no joke. The next level is $5,700. $5,700. That covers your stay, food, et cetera, et cetera. I think you stay at a castle up in Inverness, which is cool, right? Now, there's about over 400 castles in Scotland. I've stayed at a few. That's really, really, really cool. So uh, it's going to cost a couple grand to fly over there, food, rental car, whatever. My guess is, you know, I, it's, it's over a weekend. I think it's like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Or something like that, just a few days. Um, so if I were to do it, I'd be up there for two weeks. But again, I haven't decided yet. And I this current study that I'm doing now isn't going to finish till the end of the year in terms of the rate in which I'm producing and posting videos. But we'll see. We'll see how it goes. So um, either. Mm -mm 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 -mm. All right. So we're coming. We're at the top of the hour. Been going live for an hour. If you're watching this on the replay, uh, if you have any comments, any questions, leave them down below. Uh, if you haven't already, give this video a thumbs up. And I uh, watch it on the replay. After this finishes processing, I'm going to put links to other videos right here where I got my fingers. Right now, people who are watching, they just look like I'm dancing. But I'm actually going to put videos right here for people to watch on the replay. It takes about 24 hours for this thing to go. Uh, to finish processing, but later on, people watching, I will put links right here to other videos related to this current studies. All right, uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, tuning in live. Hope you enjoyed. It. I hope you learned something. Hope you benefited from it. And uh, this next week, we're going to be doing Glen Mori, a distillery. I, I visited this Glen Fiddick, and I also visited Glen Mori uh, when I was in Scotland. So, all right, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Until next time, Salam Jiva.